My name is Manny Santos, former Marine Staff Sergeant, retired 1976. And this story is about part of my life. I was born and raised in Massachusetts. I went into the Marine Corps straight out of uh, my week off from school. I enlisted at the age of 18. And uh, my brother was already in the Corps for four years and he kept telling me not to go into the Corps. So that's why I went into the Marine Corps. We flew in down there, North Carolina, and took a bus to South Carolina, South Carolina at uh, Paris Island. And uh, just like in the movies, you hear a bunch of noise, all of a sudden you get the DIs char charging you guys, get off the bus, get off the bus. And we ended up standing at attention in formation for a couple hours, waiting for them to do what they had to do. Ribbons that I received, one of the medals I received was for being the an expert shooter on the rifle. So this is the M16 that we qualified with. Boot camp was tough. I was a little bit overweight, but boy, I was lean and mean when I got out. Marine Corps is really tough on you know, as far as what you're doing and where you're doing and how you're doing it. It's all up to them. And one little thing happened to me while I was there that really got me going after was uh, I was at a class, had my head down, and the drill instructor told me, Private Santos, get your head up. And the Private Santos said, I can hear you just as well looking down as I can looking up. Whoa, that was a mistake, big mistake. They had me out there the next morning, bright eyed and bushy tailed, running all day long with a full pack. So needless to say, they broke me down and then they built you up at the end of boot camp. This is a picture of platoon 191 out of boot camp. And this one is the young kid that I am, 19 years old out of boot camp. Vietnam, they get, flew out of Travis Air Force Base in a civilian airplane. And we flew into Nam. And as we got over the Vietnam, we came straight down, as straight down as a big jet could fly, hit the ground and went all the way to the nearest bunker so we could get out of the plane because of sniper fire all the time on that area. So getting off the plane, it was June, and very hot, very humid like an oven, very scared. We had no weapons at the time yet. In Vietnam, we started off in, uh, I started off in Da Nang for a couple of weeks of orientation and getting used to the weather, getting issued our weapons and then I ended up going up north to the DMZ, which was for seven months at Camp Carroll, then LZ Stud, then Vandegrift, and back to Da Nang. First day that I took incoming. At our campsite, we had houses, 155 houses, 175, about 100 yards on the other side of the campsite. Every time they would shoot out, I couldn't tell if it was incoming or outgoing. I duck all the time. And the guys that had been there a while said, you'll know the difference. Well, it came one day when I was off duty, out with just my sandals and shorts on, 50 yards from the bunker, and I heard a pop, and it sounded like a freight train coming in, and I hit the ground, and it hit the ground. And then I got up running, and those 50 yards, I probably would have beat anybody in the, in the field, left my sandals behind, went in there barefooted. From that point on, I knew what income what it would sound like. This was again from the top of a hill, explosion down and they set off the ammo dump below the hill. So we had to move out of there. And when we came back, this was what's left of our living quarters, which were tents. This is a piece of shrapnel. It comes off to the head of a rocket from the enemy. It hit outside of my tent and just shattered everywhere. I caught a little bit on my shoulder and not much else. And we, our bunkers in a different area, so we ran out of our tents and into the bunker to protect ourselves from this piece and many, many, many more of them that come off. I was a crypto analyst and a ditty chaser. What they do is you have a typewriter in front of you and the enemy sends out Morse code and we copy it on a typewriter and we get it to our linguist and they can tell us and we tell our grunts where the enemy is and what they're doing. 
So that's what we were, we were security. Every once in a while we would go out on patrol, do what we call directional finding. We'd have about three patrols out, listen to the enemy, figure out the frequency, and then at headquarters would get all three frequencies and we could get a square to where the enemy is. I find we locate the grunts eliminate. There's a bunker and we're working under the bunker. Right here is a hole <laughs> and it wasn't made by us. We just missed our bunker. This, as you see it on here, it's like the steps going in that same angle. Very little stay in touch as far as they have nowadays. What we have was mail, letters. This is me thinking about the whole place. When I first got there, wondering what am I doing here? And my mother sent me some linguisa. Here I am chopping down one long piece of linguisa. Delicious. I am chopping down on that linguisa again. And also every once in a while we got to get on a, a radio, which is a short wave radio, and, tran and transmit it through one short wave radio in, in the United States. And you can talk to your family at home, about five minutes each. Well, when we're off duty, which is normally 12 on, 12 off, we have, we'll play cards like pinochle, maybe poker, cribbage, and read books. That's about it. At Pinochle, they thought I was cheating because I was winning all the time. <laughs> this is one of the bunkers when have an M16, M60 machine gun at that time. Here's myself again, just posing with a machine gun. M60 machine gun. This is a comical pose of me with a, some uh, whiskey and a sh flower in it. This is basically what you wore when you're off duty. Shorts, sandals, and nothing else. It's just too hot for anything else. As you can see, it looks like I have a tan, but everything is red. All the soil around you is red, red, red. So when I got back from Vietnam, I ended up washing off my tan. We didn't take too many showers over there. You don't want to smell good. The enemy will smell you. I uh, went into one of the tents one day, and there was a half dozen guys in there eating some peppers of some type. I thought it was bell pepper or whatever. And they're called uh, habaneros. And they were just eating them like candy, but I didn't notice they were all Mexican guys. And this white guy comes in there and says, yeah, let me try one. They laughed their butts off. I burnt so bad, I had to get water and that only made it worse. What I needed was something, something else, like milk. That, I remember that as something funny. And believe it or not, this is my brother and myself. We were in Nam together, more or less the same time, but he was in Da Nang and I was up at Camp Carroll about couple hours away by truck. We're not supposed to be together, but Portuguese will be Portuguese. This here picture, believe it or not, is taken in Da Nang, the three of us, the three brothers in my family and one sister. My brother Charlie, big mustache, me, my brother Dick, he's actually five foot 10, but he's scrouching there. He visited us, all visited Da Nang at the same time. We didn't show this picture to my mother until we got back. We returned back to Travis Air Force Base. The plane left like the plane came in, zoomed up and out of away from Vietnam, and finally we landed in Travis Air Force Base, which was outside of Fairfield, California. And we got out to this old broken down sign that said, welcome home. There was no band, there was no people. There was just the people running this place. No, no welcoming in. But we didn't care at the time because we were just happy to be home. But we learned a lesson. The troops that we have over in Iraq and Afghanistan and any of those troops, we support them. We do everything we can and we make sure they get a good home coming from everyone. This here is November 18th, 1976, when I got out of the Marine Corps. Got my full set of ribbons my badges, my medals, and this here's a check they gave us back then was $17,000 for me to get out of the Marine Corps. But I got out with a disability and any more things that are wrong with me from being in the service like post-traumatic stress disorder or anything like that, the VA is taking care of me now, so that's okay. Well, I'll tell you what, it makes you appreciate what you have back home. That was the main thing. You had nothing out there. You saw people that lived in cardboard houses. 
You saw people that lived in hooches. You saw people that were starving, people that were dying. So you just wanted to come back to the United States and just appreciate everything you have and everything you own. Well, the best thing you can pass on is support your troops. That's the absolute best thing, no matter what the government is doing, no matter if we think it's the, war, the war is wrong or right, support your troops. Well, the only thing I'd, the ending of what I'd like to say is, you know a Marine. He's always faithful. He's always there. He'll never forget being a Marine. So once a Marine, always a Marine. There's no such thing as an ex-Marine. And uh, support your troops again.